Hello everyone. My name is Mohammad Haris Rais. I am a PhD student at Safe Lab Security and Forensics Engineering Lab at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, the lab is led by Dr. Fan Ahmad and is mostly focused around industrial cybersecurity and its forensics. Today I'm presenting a hardware-based uh, PLC memory acquisition framework called Kairos. And in this work, we are collaborating with Rima Asmarawad and Dr. Yuan Lopez Jr. from Oak Ridge National Lab. An industrial control system is a collection of devices, uh, a variety of network, and a control software to basically operate or automate a physical process. A physical process could be a gas pipeline, power grid, a nuclear power plant, water treatment, any other. And these physical or field devices, they actually interact with the physical process to connect it to the cyber world. And field devices themselves are connected to a variety of uh, networks, uh, to a control center that hosts different control software, engineering software, and HMI. And this control center is connected through corporate LAN, which is typically connected to internet. Now, if we see the uniqueness of this industrial control system, it lies in the, this interfacing layer um, where we have these field devices, which are most commonly programmable logic controllers or PLCs. A PLC is a rugged industry specs uh, embedded system. It has a CPU, volatile, non-volatile memory components, and optionally some removable storage, and a host of input and output modules to connect to the physical process. The control application running on the firmware is in PLC is usually called control logic program. And PLC executes a, a loop, a continuous loop in which it gets the state, current state of the system through the sensors, and then apply some control logic over that state and calculate uh, new output values that are applied to the actuators uh, where they tend to steer the physical process to a new state. And then uh, we get the new state of the system and the loop continues. If you talk of memory forensics of PLCs, there are two distinct research areas in memory forensics. One is the acquisition of memory and the other is the analysis of memory. As far as acquisition of PLC memory is concerned, um, so far the research is mostly focused on the software tools like debugging tools or uh, ICS protocols, or maybe analyzing the network data. But if we have the physical access of the device available, so why not to explore the hardware-based approach? JTAG interface is explored in the past as well, but only for modifying PLC firmware. So far there is, there is no work or framework that guides a forensic investigator on the process of extracting memory, a complete memory of a PLC through JTAG. A little bit on the JTAG. In 1980s, when ICs were shrinking and circuit boards were getting more and more complex, so the testing of the circuits became difficult with the existing approaches. For example, if you see this IC, it's a ball grid array design where the contacts are not on the sides, rather on the bottom of the IC. And when we put this IC on a circuit board and solder it. And if there are some errors, like if you see it from the side view, if this there is an open circuit or there are some short circuits. So conventional approach is very difficult to find these type of errors. Then the vendors sat together and came up with an idea of including some kind of circuitry within the chip that should facilitate the testing. 
And later this was standardized by IEEE uh, as IEEE 1149.1 or boundary scan architecture. If you see, this is a, a normal IC package where the core circuitry comprising of transistors and gates, they are connected to um, the outside pins of the IC. In JTAG, there is a boundary scan serial register or shift register that is that sits between the core circuitry and the pins. And there is a tap controller, which is a small state machine that can control these registers. And through these registers, uh, a user can control the output going out of the pins or can also read the input that is coming into, into a particular pin. And that's how it facilitates the circuit testing. But later on, uh, this approach was also utilized for debugging and embedded system programming also. Kairos framework uh, constitutes two phases. In the first phase, we create a memory profile using a test PLC. And in the second phase, we use that profile to acquire the memory of a suspect PLC. So in phase one, the first step is the hardware assessment. So while analyzing the hardware of a PLC, we are mostly interested in the microcontroller, the architecture of the microcontroller, and its internal memory and uh, volatile and non-volatile memory components, the JTAG pins of the microcontroller, and the memory address map, like where the flash uh, resides and where the RAM resides, and what are the uh, peripheral addresses, and so on. The other component is, uh, are the memory elements that are available in the circuit boards because the internal memory of a micro microcontroller is not sufficient. So there are external memory components as well, like uh, volatile memory components or non-volatile memory components. And then the removable storage, which is although not part of the memory, but it uh, facilitates in uh, verification of the memory content that we acquire. The main sources of uh, information for hardware assessment, the first one is the uh, PLC hardware manuals. Although they don't specify a lot of details, but there are some hints like, well, how much is the code memory or the IO memory or the con controller architecture and the backup options available or not. So they give a hint of uh, what type of, uh, how much is the memory that is available. Next is the visual inspection by disassembling. So we disassemble the PLC and see the boards. There could be like four type of boards, communication, main board, power, but we are interested in the main boards. And we examine the ICs that are available on the, on the circuit boards. And again, we are looking at the controller IC and the memory elements IC. Once we find those IC, they're hopefully their part numbers, then we search the data sheets and find out uh, the details of the memory, like how much is the capacity of the memory and what are the different parameters, what's the type of memory and so on. So the next step is to identify the JTAG pins from the processor data sheet. If the processor's data sheet is available, it clearly tells us like which pin is the JTAG pin uh, mode selector or input output pins. So, what we can do if we have that, those available, we can clearly see on the, um, on the processor IC where those pins are located. And once we do that, the next step is to identify the JTAG contact pad. Although like uh, we identify the pin on the processor, but it is very risky to use these pins uh, for extracting information or uh, controlling the uh, tap controller. So uh, even the vendors, they use a pad, contact pad, through which they control uh, uh, the tap controller. And once the circuit uh, testing is completed, they usually remove the connector on that pad. But we can still find that contact pad available on the, on the circuit board. 
So how do we find it? One way is to do, do connectivity tests uh, through multimeters or, or use some heuristics like uh, what are the pads that are available in the vicinity, uh, empty pads that are available in the vicinity. To just give a quote an example, like there are four different POC that we were working on and uh, these are their JTAG contact pads. In one case, it is even labeled, right? But in most other cases, there are no uh, headers installed uh, and there is no labeling, but it's still the JTAG, as you can see, is very near to the uh, processor. So if the data sheet is available and we know the pins and we see a potential pad, we can do a connectivity test, like through multimeters, we can find which of the pins is actually connected to these particular pins of the, of the processor. And then once we identify uh, a, a, a contact pad as a JTAG pad, what we do, we install a header on it, solder a header on it, and route a cable out of it because to use JTAG, we have to power up the PLC and for that we have to reassemble the PLC. So another way is just to solder the wires on the contact pad as we already identified the pins. So instead of going for a complete header, just solder the wires. But this approach is not that robust and it's uh, risky as well. It's a small extra effort actually gives more dividends. So at times vendors do disable the JTAG after testing. So we need to ascertain the status of the JTAG. And for that, we use a small device called JTAGulator. Uh, and it actually, uh, we connect the contact pad uh, that was available on the circuit board uh, to the uh, connector available on the JTAGulator. It, what it does, it do all sort of combinations and permutations to find out the uh, exact pins. Uh, uh, JTAG pins. And if it successfully finds out, it also confirms that the JTAG is, is still functional in the IC. Uh, one caution, the, while uh, using JTAG later, the ground should match. So you have to manually match the ground before, uh, before starting the JTAG relation. The next step is the memory acquisition setup. So once we find the JTAG pins, like how to use the JTAG for memory acquisition. So JTAG has like few pin outs and they, these pins work at the uh, controller's operating voltages. So how to, I mean, we, need, we would require some voltage converters. Then we would also require some BSDL files and then create programs to exploit JTAG for reading memory. And instead of going through all that hassle, the simpler approach is to use off-the-shelf JTAG debuggers that have very extensive libraries for the data, for the processors that uh, they support. So like these are some famous debuggers that we can use after verifying if they support our architecture. So once the setup is ready, the next step is to create the memory map. So uh, memory acquisition is uh, through JTAG is a very is a slow and risky process. However, fortunately, PLCs only use a fraction of the complete address space of the uh, um, of the processor. Like if uh, for a thirty-two bit processor uh, of a probable four GB space, usually PLCs uses hundred MB or even less than that, or a bit more than that. So if we are able to eliminate the unused spaces, unused address ranges and redundant address blocks, the address blocks that point to the same memory location and the unacquirable address spaces which are pointing to the peripherals. So if we are able to eliminate this, we can actually uh, find out that small fraction, which really helps us in, in uh, catering for this slow process of, uh, of JTAG recovery. Now, if you see here, I mean, uh, these are the address ranges that actually point to unique address blocks. And some of the address ranges that may point to same address blocks. So we are not interested in both of them or all of them. We are only interested in one of them. If we acquire one, we are good uh, and we don't need others. 
Then there are some address ranges that are pointing to peripherals, which uh, may crash the PLC. And we are not uh, we are not interested in acquiring these address spaces. We have to eliminate that. And then there are other ranges that are pointing to nowhere, and we are not interested in them as well. So one caution in uh, in eliminating the data redundancy. So not all duplicate address blocks are redundant. So this is an important thing. For example, if the firmware is loaded in the non-volatile memory and the volatile memory as well, in the RAM as well. So these two are considered as two different artifacts from forensic perspective. So if we just see like the, the, the both are same, so they may be pointing to the, the, the address ranges are pointing to the same uh, memory and just ignore one, that won't be correct. So what we should do, we should, uh, employ some kind of logic like address boundaries. If no unused pins are identified, then we have to keep the copies. And another approach is to write to an address and to see the effect on other copies. The next step is to eliminate the unacquirable address blocks, which are which we may be pointing to peripherals and they can crash the PLC. So uh, to identify them is one way is to check the processor data sheets. If they are not available, then do a crash and learn exercise. It's a patient exercise uh, uh, that we have to perform on the test PLC. And it will crash the PLC. So uh, if we have some kind of software-based device recovery technique, like maybe PLC provides some kind of mechanism to reboot it, or if not, then we can also use uh, power supplies that can be controlled through software. So it can really facilitate uh, this crash and learn exercise to identify unacquired letters blocks. So the next step is to optimize the acquisition parameters. So as JTAG based acquisition is below the firmware level, it may expire some watchdog timers resulting in a PLC crash. Uh, as a matter of fact, the optimization also helps in speeding up the process as well. And it should be performed on a per uh, IC or more specifically per address block region. The parameters that we should optimize uh, includes like acquisition speed, block size, a debug as buffer size, and the wait time between consecutive read operations. And how to find these, the value for these parameters? One way is to theoretically derive them from the processor information, the IC's information like the refresh rates, et cetera, and the debugger specifications. And the other approach is a practical approach to discover it through a ramp up till crash approach, like a speed up as we do in DCP, like a speed it up till it crashes. So as there are very limited memory regions after the first initial exercise, uh, the second approach is feasible and faster and easier as well. So once we get that memory profile, we uh, do the memory acquisition of the suspect PLC. So instead of test PLC, we have the suspect PLC. We uh, set up the acquisition uh, mechanism and uh, set the parameters and acquire the memory and do a verification exercise. For verification, firmware is very helpful. It's a big, uh, it's a big file, and we can verify if we are getting the correct uh, data from the uh, through our mechanism uh, acquisition process. Other way is to find uh, through the known configured data, like the uh, uh, IP addresses and other uh, ASCII characters, for example. Uh, inventory of the PLC, or maybe uh, the project file name, et cetera. Third approach is writing and reading back. So you write, if through JTAG, we can write to the memory content as well. So we write and then read back to verify whether we are, we are writing it right and we are reading it correctly or not. So that actually verifies the uh, acquisition process. Coming over to the case study, we did a case study on a famous Ellen Bradley uh, control logic 1756, which is a modular PLC. And it was hosting a controller 1756 L61. 
So uh, coming over to the hardware assessment, the uh, main controller it's using is like VY22575, which is an ARM processor that's uh, it's written on it. But we were unable to find the data sheet even after contacting the vendor. So it was regretted. So uh, what we did, so we examined the complete board and the memory contents that are available are uh, static RAM ICs. There are four of them, each with 512 kilobytes and a NOR flash and uh, three uh, SD RAM ICs. There was a SD card as well um, that can hold like uh, the firmware backup or the program backup. Uh, so to identify the JTAG pins, there was a, a two by seven big con contact pad, which was a potential candidate. And because of the BGA design and no availability of data sheet, we could not do any connectivity testing. So what we did, we installed the header on it and a cable and routed it out and then used the JTAG later to confirm the JTAG pins and the JTAG working status. So this is our typical memory acquisition set. We used a Sager jailing debugger for it. And this is the hole that we punctured in the chassis to extract the cable out uh, and connect it to the debugger. Now talking about the redundant data, this is an example case. Like all these memory addresses are pointing to one single memory location. And if you see here, uh, these are the uh, offset, memory offset. And this is like where it is pointing to a particular device. And these are unused pins, like they don't, are, or you can say don't care pins. So after, after acquiring the data, we performed a mem uh, parameters optimization exercise as well. So we, there were only 28 distinct ranges of different sizes. So we applied a ramping up technique instead of going through the theoretical exercise of finding the parameters, parameter values. And uh, one important thing is like, if the PLC is in run mode or PLC is in program mode, it may uh, respond differently to different acquisition parameters. The finalized address ranges, uh, some of them, if you see here, this, these three, it's uh, like 16 MB block. And it is repeated like eight times till this, uh, this particular address. So uh, only acquisition once is sufficient. And then there are some uh, addresses that actually hang the processor, which probably pointing to some peripherals and we should avoid them. And then if you see here, the data above the six, eight, all zeros was not in use. It was, the data was nil and it, uh, a point until all Fs. So like more than half of the address space was not utilized. So phase two was the acquisition of uh, memory acquisition of suspect PLC. So we did not have another PLC of the same model. So we used the same test PLC for the next phase. Uh, we uh, programmed, uh, we uh, write, write a small program using a PyLink library that was available for Sager Jailing debugger. And our program can uh, operate in three modes. It can acquire all the complete acquirable memory, or we can provide a customized range to extract that particular memory region. And we can also do signature-based acquisition, like if we have some markers available for the start and end of a particular zone, we can, we can acquire that particular memory as well. So for verification, reasonable contents for confidence was already attained during the profile creation. Like when we were uh, identifying the redundant blocks, so what we were doing, we were actually confirming um, the acquisition correctness as well because we were matching the uh, different region uh, data. But we also downloaded the firmware from the vendor's website and then matched it from the multiple instances that we were getting from in the memory and we perfectly matched them. 
So we also did an exercise of uh, acquiring data across the memory, all different regions over multiple restarts. And we, the result was 100%. Limitations, uh, we need a separate PLC for prof uh, profile creation as we cannot risk uh, using the suspect PLC. Uh, it's a hardware-based acquisition, definitely requires hardware interference, disassembly, soldering, header installation, et cetera. And if the vendor has disabled the JTAG interface, this approach cannot work. In future, we are uh, planning to employ and evaluate Kairos framework on other PLCs as well. So to conclude, we presented Kairos framework for hardware-based memory acquisition of PLCs. Um, Kairos guides a forensic researcher on how to tackle the hardware challenges related to JTAG and deal with proprietary hardware and customized ICs with no data sheets and to generate a memory map and optimize the acquisition parameters. And we also presented a case study of the framework on Allen Bradley Control Logic 1956. Uh, thank you.